um, I'm just taking advantage of the fact that this prickly pear flowers are open now. Um, oh, this is uh, the uh, prickly pears with the pads are Opuntia. And this is Opuntia polyacantha, and that means many spines. And us gardeners know all about their spines. We often go home with some. Um, but they're, they're really beautiful. And the, um, the prickly pears, you now there are species that are native into New England. Um, and then there are species that are, are tropical that can only be grown as a houseplant. But there are a lot, lot of uh, prickly pears that are winter hardy. That little rusty colored iris over there is another one of the wild parents of the Louisiana iris. That's iris fulva, referring to rusty red. It's a sweet little thing, blooms for a fairly long time. Which way shall we go? Oh, here's, we might as well see this beauty. It's quite a flower. The flower is bigger than the plant. It's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The, the Choyas um, used to be classified with the Opuntias. They're now in a, a separate genus, Cylindro Opuntia. And some of these real thorny ones, the thorns aren't so much uh, for protection as they are for shade. This is its own shade structure. Uh, you know, some, some cactus are hairy um, and that's cold protection and uh, sh sun protection because these are native to the southwest U.S. and to Mexico where the sun is unrelenting. Um, and so these, these spines are actually um, more for shade. And I'm, I don't, re don't ever do this, but I, I've, I found out that this one is actually not that, um, it's actually not even piercing my skin, but there are other choyas known as jumping choyas that are a nightmare. And um, their long spines have little barbs on them, so they're really hard to pull out. But usually you don't end up with the little spine in you, or just a little spine in you. You end up with a section of the stem because that's their means of getting dispersed. If you're a coyote and you, or a deer in the desert and you bump into one of those and you're, you know, 30 miles later it falls off you, well, that plant's now started a new plant, you know, far from the mother plant. Um, so the jumping choyas look a lot like this, but their spines are different. That's one there, but a, one relatively um, unspined one. I should point out, you know, I don't, it's sort of not of a spring open house plant. It's sort of like an old frost-free part of the year. These uh, shrubby salvias, they're blooming now. They'll be blooming in the uh, fall open house, summer open house. They'll almost make it, and they won't be in bloom at the winter open house, but they just bloom for months and months. They're often called autumn sages, I think where they're native in the southwest U.S. and Mexico. Really hot, dry summers, they tend to shut down, but with our more abundant moisture, they tend to keep on blooming all summer. They are so worthwhile plants. You know, they're the kind of thing that's never a showstopper, like a lily or something, but most plants that are showstoppers are in bloom for two weeks. These things that aren't really showstoppers, but bloom for many, many months, sort of are the foil to all the big showy things that come and go, and hummingbirds love them. Has anybody seen hummingbirds yet this year? Yeah. Good. Good. I haven't yet, but I, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that other people are seeing them. I think tomorrow I'll put up my hummingbird feeder at home. Oh, okay. There are so many Alliums. It's a huge genus. The alliums are the same genus as onions and garlics. I, oh good, it, this is Allium canadense. Can you imagine where that plant's from? Uh, I think Allium canadense is the same species as our wild garlic that we pull out of gardens and yard, yard, uh, lawns. Uh, um, except this is a form where it has flowers. The, our common weedy one, it makes little plants up on where the flowers should be instead of these pretty flowers. The um, Hesperal is starting to bloom. That's another great long blooming plant that hummingbirds really like. The typical color is coral, coral red, but this is a 
yellow form of it. It's just the scape will, you know, eventually get tall and just bloom for months. See, it's a, you might guess correctly that it's a um, yucca relative. Hesperella parviflora Arizona sunrise. What's that? Oh, okay. This is, oh my goodness, they're fabulous. This is the asphodel of um, the Mediterranean and it's almost done blooming. And what these are, the fruit, the, um, and I use fruit in the botanical sense. To, to a botanist, a fruit is the part of the plant that has seeds. It, it doesn't indicate necessarily that it's edible. Um, but any, the part of the plant that um, has the seeds is the fruit. So tomatoes and squash and cucumbers are fruits, technically. Um, it was a spike of yellow flowers, quite showy. Um, Mediterranean native, I think in a dry summer, it might go dormant and then come back up in the fall. Yeah, the fruit are quite, quite wonderful. I don't imagine so, yeah. I don't try, I, Dustin, do I have a reputation for eating things in the garden? Yeah, I'll eat a lot of things in the garden. But no, I don't, I don't eat anything if I don't know that it's edible. Oh, good, that leaf now. Oh, that's what I tried this. Um, the yuccas are very dramatic in bloom and um, yucca flowers are edible and I remembered that I tried this one a few weeks ago and it, you know it's edible but it wasn't delicious um, so it varies depending on the species the genus yucca it's both their common name and scientific name um, is quite large and there's a big plant of another species over there, Yucca triculiana, and those flowers tasted like asparagus. And uh, two weeks ago or so, I, I led a little tour of, um, uh, of people that worked for the Agriculture Extension Service focused on nutrition, and so they were real interested in what was edible in the garden. And one of the people was from Brazil, and she said there they use the yucca flowers to just mixed in with scrambled eggs and stuff. So they, they tasted just like a, asparagus. I think it's done blooming now. You know, th this one is okay. It's just not very flavorful. But the, the petals are fairly substantial. They're sort of almost waxy. Yeah. You can grab a petal and eat it. Like, uh, zucchini flowers? When they kind of yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, this is sort of peak season for the baptizios, the, um, and I can see that one there and this yellow one here. Is this screaming yellow? Let's see. No, this is a wild collected one. Um, when we were looking at the mimosa, I mentioned that it's in the legume family, but its flowers weren't a typical legume flower. If you've grown peas or beans, you've seen the flowers structured very much like that. In the legume world, you have the, uh, the w wings and the keel, or maybe I have it backwards, but 
Now that kind of arrangement is a typical pea or bean flower. The Baptisia is a small genus, I don't know, maybe about a dozen species native to the uh, North America. And Tony has done a lot of breeding work and produced a lot of really um, beautiful hybrids. But this is a wild collected plant from Texas. It's um, Baptisia sphericarpa, meaning round fruit. Um, most of the other Baptisias have like an elongated pod, sort of like a pea pod. This is very spherical. Um, they are herbaceous perennials dying to the ground in the winter. Um, you know, blooming early. Um, really, really showy in bloom. Pleasant enough the rest of the year. Um, you know, certainly thriving in full sun. They'll, they'll do fairly well in, in part sun. What else do we see here? Oh, further up the hill? Oh, right here, Lordy. <laughs> Just around the corner. Yeah, we, we met the stinky sore maiden by the porch beginning of the tour. This is um, uh, another aroid. You can see how big the spadix is going to be. And it'll reflex open like that and have the spadix uh, sticking up. Um, this is Dracunculus vulgaris. Now, in a plant like that, you might think, yeah, that's really vulgar. But in Latin, vulgaris just means common. Um, it, this is native to southern Europe, to the Mediterranean region. So the people centuries ago, they were putting names on plants, you know, it was common to them. Um, it's growing from a tuber underground and uh, is dormant in the winter, but comes up quite early in, um, before it's even spring. Some have already finished blooming. Um, I'm thinking there might be another one further on that's in bloom. Here's a, another Baptisia. Um, I'll look for the label. I'm pretty sure that's Baptisia australis. Australis just meaning southern. Um, and the wonderful blue of that species. What do we have? Well, actually, that um, seems to be a hybrid because it doesn't have a specific epithet. It's blue mound. I'm glad when I see something with blue in the name that is actually blue and not violet. Um, beautiful color. There's other irises in this area. Maybe we've seen enough iris. Hmm? Oh, my goodness. Okay. There's such a huge diversity of plants in this garden. I thought I shouldn't assume that I knew, knew what I was looking at. Um, in, you know, zone 7B, almost zone 8, there aren't that many uh, palms that are winter hardy. Uh, this is a windmill palm, a trachycarpus. I thought it was trachycarpus uh, fortunii, but it's a rarer species, trachycarpus takil, T-A-K-I-L. And But it's sh doing what is really typical of the trachycarpus, this real shaggy fiber on the trunk. Um, you know, I, I've read that um, peasants or people without much money in China would sometimes make winter coats out of that. And that in 2011, when I was in China, I saw a you know, big, like old VW bus with it piled up on, on the roof of the car. So they were using it for something. Um, Trachycarpus fortunii can get, oh, you know, 20, 30 feet tall. Um, and, you know, if you're in a zone 7B or colder, um, it's really worthwhile to buy one of the hardy strains of windmill palm. Years ago, when people were just starting to grow windmill palms in this area, I bought three seedlings. One died the first winter, one struggled for a bunch of winters and then died, but the third one just never was bothered by the same winters. And they're all in the same garden. So, you know, we sell a number of hardy strains, like Bulga one from Bulgaria and one from Greensboro, North Carolina. Is that thing cut? Because that trunk looks pretty wide. Has it been cut at some point or is that how it grows? Um, it hasn't been cut at all. Um, it does 
seem oddly tapered because yeah. trunks, I mean, uh, palms are monocots and they don't have the cambium, so the, so the trunk doesn't get wider over time. Um, so um, I don't know why it would taper that way. Normally they're sort of straight up all the way. Oh, that smells great big hybrid elderberry called is this mocha chocolata or something. Is that it? I don't know. I oh, was laughing at the name. yeah, no, it, it has so, chocolate in its name. Um, in garden centers, you often encounter uh, elderberries uh, with really beautiful foliage, often black, sometimes yellow. Um, but if they're derived from the European species, uh, Sambucus nigra, they, they don't last here long term, but this is a hybrid that is very, very vigorous. And another one, um, and there isn't a plant out in this garden to show you, is a yellow leaf form of our local native, Sambucus um, canadensis. And that's a really good plant too, because it's, it's adapted to our climate. So. I would say don't spend your money on the fancy cultivars that show up in garden centers and stick to either this guy and I think I can find its label on it or the um, yellow form of canadensis which what is that one blonde I think it's blonde and everything that's yellow nowadays seems to get named blonde this or that yeah um, all right This garden has now been planted for two weeks. Um, if you've been here before, you might remember this was a fairly ugly puddle. Um, you know, it caught runoff, but uh, and did really good job of growing weeds. So they've changed, t turned it into a bog, um, where it'll still capture some water, but it it won't. There shouldn't be standing water. This overflow. Of, that there that will carry the um, excess water into that stream. Um, you can see it's featuring largely uh, pitcher plants, but other companions. I was told, oh yeah, th no wait, I was told there's a bunch of Venus flytraps down here. I haven't... And the trunk is um, white, white cedar, which is Camisipris uh, thyroides. Uh, a camisipris that occurs in eastern North America and that that's an ancient trunk that, that they uncovered. I don't know how long it'll last now that it's exposed to the elements. Oh, nobody's asked what our various flags mean. We use about every color flag in the garden and um, a lot, most of them we pull out before you come to visit. Um, but we leave the green ones and the white ones in there. The green ones are for a plant that needs a label. So I'm not able to tell you who this is because I don't know all the baptisias by sight, but it's a lovely thing. Um, 
And then the white ones are flags uh, where Tony wants to remember that he wants to add a plant there. So uh, uh, pretty much every plant in the garden is placed by uh, Tony Avent. We How are his... Does he come around and make that decision? Um, it's sporadic, but fairly frequently. Maybe, maybe at least on average once every two or three weekends. Usually Monday, we walk through the entire garden and we've only gone through a small part of it on this tour. Look for where he's place plants out in the garden and we dutifully plant them. Yeah, and then they get a blue flag, which means it's a newly planted plant. So the people that keep the plant database have to record that there is now a baptisia in this location. And, um, and then it eventually, before too soon, before too long, gets one of these engraved labels, which we make in house. Um, How do you pick the plants? Just, he has a list of them or? You'd have to ask Tony himself okay. to ask that. You know, he has, sometimes they're just plants that we have in production for sale and we want to have them out in the garden. But more often than not, they're things we haven't tried before, he hasn't tried before, so okay. they go out somewhere. Uh, this garden, all of Tony's garden, has never been about growing the tried and true things. It's all about trying things we haven't tried before, which means that a lot of plants prove that they're not suited to our climate and are you know, soon dead or don't survive the winter or don't survive the summer. But, you know, so, you know, Tony's always been about finding things that we can add to our gardens that we didn't know we could even grow here before. Um, I need to uh, I stop and move on to other things. I didn't realize I took quite this much time. Um, I really appreciate you coming on this tour. Um, I encourage you to go through the rest of the garden. You know, we just sort of pass through the edges. This garden is especially strong and strong, especially strong in uh, summer into early fall. Um, you know, and we didn't even go through the shade gardens up by the first house. And uh, you know, if you're not already in the habit of visiting it at most uh, open houses, I really encourage you to do that because every time, every season, you'll see different things. I've, I've not even been an employee here for a year, but I, you know, I've generally come to every open house I can and usually don't miss many because I, it's you know, such a great place to become familiar with things I haven't grown before. So thank you. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great to see you. Yeah, good to see you.